We'd like to get a chance to bring our speaker on, okay? But before we do that, I want to share something with you for those that aren't that familiar with the African American culture, okay? When we have someone up here to motivate us, to inspire us, and to share a truth with us, we speak back to them, okay? So when you see some of us saying, go ahead, Minister Farrakhan, preach that to me, don't take it personal. Try to understand where it is that we're coming from, and since I'm letting you know where we're coming from, you shouldn't be offended by it, okay? You know how it is when you go to a concert and the music is good to you and you talk to them and sing and dance with them. We do the same thing. When we go to our Baptist churches and our ministers are preaching the word to us and there's a burning fire in our soul, oh, we have to talk to them. So don't get afraid, please. Right now, I'm going, before I leave, I must, I have to commend all of the students, the co-sponsorships from President Wallace, Neil Gamsky, Judy Boyer, Chuck O'Brien, Fred Wiggins, Gloria Jean Davis, Sherelle Drain, Floyd Carroll, I could go on and on, Brisbane Ruzan, we thank you. Because without you all, it wouldn't have manifested. But it came from the, the top and it trickled down with support and that enabled us to bring Minister Farrakhan here. Right now, I'd like to bring on Mr. Clark Cradell, and he will introduce to you our Minister Farrakhan. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm glad to see all you wonderful people here to witness a wonderful evening of praise and recognition to our black brothers and sisters. We've come together tonight to show our black brothers and sisters that we are proud of their accomplishment now and in the future and what they later on accomplish in life. It always been publicized that the blacks excel in sports, but by all the different awards given out earlier, it is, it is proven that blacks have, can accomplish and are contributors to, the, to today's society. Our, our guest speaker tonight is one of the true motivators of the world today. His, his purpose of motivation go, ties hand in hand with the ceremony we just put on for you. Since the time the, since the, time the, the, the public had, the public were made aware of the organizations and what they were trying to do, we have received negative criticism to, from the paper to all sorts of activities. It went so far as to, that I be, began receiving irate letters, hate mail from different students wishing the minister not to come down. They were saying things so far as I'm not considerate, I'm inconsiderate of the Jewish Holocaust, the Jewish people, but what I really think it is is that they are being inconsiderate to the 435 year Holocaust that we are presently living on. We invited Minister Farrakhan here for the sole purpose to help raise our consciousness, remind us of the past, so that we will never let that happen again. Everyone knows that once motivation is established, there is no limits that a person can achieve and excel in the world today. I would ask you to help me welcome one of the true motivators in Minister Louis Farrakhan.
In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, I bear witness that there is but one God, the Creator of all things, Revealer of all truth, Sender of all prophets. We thank Allah for sending Moses and the Torah, or Old Testament, Jesus, the Injil or New Testament, and Muhammad and the Holy Quran. Peace be upon all of these worthy servants of God. I thank Allah personally for raising up in our midst a divine leader, teacher, and guide who has made the Torah, the Gospel, and the Quran relevant to the liberation struggle of black people in America and oppressed people throughout the world. I speak of none other than the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, uh, my teacher, our teacher. It is a great honor and privilege for me to be here tonight to celebrate with you your second annual African American Recognition Ceremony. I listened with great joy to the students and the faculty advisor, and I also join with them in congratulating all of those who received awards and particularly to the graduating seniors who will be going out on life's road to pursue, hopefully, that which will not only be beneficial to you and your family, but be beneficial to our people as well. Illinois State University is a microcosm of the larger society. So whatever you find in the microcosm, you will find it in the larger society. When the students decided to bring Louis Farrakhan to this campus, they received a great deal of opposition. Because, of course, to some, I'm a bigot, an anti-Semite, a hater, and whatnot. To my people, I'm the exact opposite of that. And therein lies the problem. How could a man be looked at by one group as a lover and another group as a hater? By one group as a teacher of immense value, by another group as a demagogue, a bigot, and a hater? Is he really what your campus paper says he is? I'm glad that you had the courage to come out and hear me for yourself. <laughs> to say that Farrakhan came here to this august house of learning to inspire you to hate is to belittle my intelligence and the intelligence of this audience. And if the professors at Illinois State University have done their job. 
then they need not fear a bigot, a racist, a hater, and an anti-Semite. For if you have done your job, and you have educated these young people, then they will assign me to the rubbish heap to which haters, bigots, and anti-Semites belong. However, if you have failed in your duty, and you have not properly educated your students, or you have purposely miseducated them, then of course I understand your fear. Because your fear is that when truth comes, falsehood vanishes and falsehood is a vanishing thing. I was particularly struck as I read some of the articles in the campus paper characterizing who and what I am and the great effort that you went through to educate the students on Louis Farrakhan. I'm sure that you should realize that I am the best teacher of who and what I am. And if, if you have nothing to fear, then let me represent myself and let them make the judgment as to who and what I am. My coming here, they say, is bad for group relations. What group? You act so hypocritically as though you all had good relations before I got here. <laughs> While the converse is really the truth. You don't get along well at all. So why blame all of that on me? I'm not the one who founded this institution. And why make me the racist? <laughs> As though I created the disease that afflicts this university afflicts America and the world. I am a victim as they are of your racism. So many of today's whites don't understand the legacy of racism. Farrakhan is not oppressing you. And black folk don't have the power to oppress you even should they want to. So racism has a power component involved in the equation. One not only dislikes another, but has the power to enforce his dislike. Not only have whites dislike us, but they had the power ever since our fathers were brought to these shores as slaves to enforce their dislike, their hatred of us. And that's why we're in the condition that we're in. We're not the racists. We have come to end racism once and for all. They said, Farrakhan doesn't want to see black and white together. He's antithetical to the preaching of Dr. Martin Luther King as though that makes me a vile, despicable person. 
He's for separation, please. <laughs> you must remember, we didn't come on the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria, or the Mayflower. We had separate quarters on the ships that brought us here, and we still live in separate quarters today. So don't say that Farrakhan is a separatist. Who is a better separatist than you? Talk to me. You don't live with us. You don't worship with us. It's difficult to get you to socialize with us. So what are you talking about? We have never been integrated in this society, have we? So why put it on me? I'm the separatist. Who separated us in the first place? Did, well, there's a bigger power that separated us. We all had boundaries. But it is natural for people to overcome the boundaries that separate people. And at first, we may not like each other because we're different from each other. But after a while, we should get to know one another and to respect one another, even if we don't love one another. But look at the situation. Many of our black students do not understand what has happened to us. And many white students do not understand what has happened to us. And therefore, when you look at black people in an inferior position and condition, not only in America, but in the world, you wonder, why is this? Are we really genetically inferior? Is it that white folk are the great achievers and, and, and black folk? really are just the good singers and dancers and musicians and ball players. Well, how did that sister get a 4.0 average? How, is she a, a freak of some kind? No, brother and sister. We achieve what we will to achieve. Now, now, now they are saying to the black students, you brought that bigot here, we're going to make you pay for it. This is an awful thing for the college to do. You give the black students $13,000 in their budget, a measly $13,000. I want to talk about racism tonight and bigotry tonight and anti-Semitism tonight. I want to talk about a living, vile hatred tonight. $13,000 they give to the black students. And then they told the black students, since you all got together and raised $10,000 for Farrakhan's honorarium, we're gonna cut you next year $3,000, so next year you'll only get $10,000. We'll teach you niggers a thing or two. speaker of their choice. They pay funds to this institution and their money is also in student 
student activities fees and you bring people that have no relevance to them and you pay them out of those same funds. Don't be dismayed, dear black students, that they give me a jive $10,000 honorarium. Don't be dismayed. Mr. Reagan gets 50,000 to do this. <laughs> Mr. Donaldson of ABC gets 25,000. Fawn Hall, the young lady that only claimed the fame is that she shredded documents, gets 15,000 per appearance. But of course, they're worth it. Because they're white. They're popular. Come on, talk to me. You devalued black people and we are not worthy how could a black man be worthy to command such a fee black people don't have wisdom black people are not consequential well you stay here with me tonight for just one hour and by the help of God I'll teach you more in one hour than you've learned in all of your life. I'm not bragging. I didn't graduate from one of these institutions. But I have been blessed with a superior teacher. And what I have to impart to black students and to white students and to Asian students and to Jewish students and to whoever will listen, if you will listen with an unbiased mind, you will go out of here, possibly, with a chance to make yourself a better person. I would not waste my time or yours with trivia. But I want you to listen to this. Black students may not be the majority here, but white Scouts go all over the country scouting the best black talent for your football team and the best black talent for your basketball team. And it is the football team and the basketball team that brings the biggest revenue to this institution. How in the hell are you going to tell me you're going to give black students $10,000 for a whole year when it is black people who are bringing you the money to this institution? Talk to me. pay money to see the Illini. The who? Red the Red Birds. With a whole lot of black birds on the Red Bird team. So, we're not asking for more than we should have but what the black students should demand is their fair share 
and you should never punish them for bringing me here. You should reward them because each person that came in here tonight paid money to come in here. They use their money to pay me, but you take this money back to student activities fund. That's a damn shame. You're not only wicked, but you're thieves. This is a people that don't have a voice. And every time they get a voice, that voice is stilled by the powers that be because they fear a voice that they don't control that black people are listening to. Today, Every black leader that we have is being manipulated. So that today we have a beautiful mayor in New York, Mayor Dinkins, and a governor in Virginia, Governor Wilder, and a mayor in Seattle, and a new mayor in Cleveland, and a new mayor in Hartford, and we applaud and when they write of these black men they say these are the new politicians they are non-threatening what does that mean if i am threatening for what? I don't shoot anybody. I haven't robbed anybody. I'm not planning to. <laughs> but I'm threatening, threatening to those who have lied to you and deceived you because Jesus said you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So now the truth makes me threatening and being courageous enough to tell it makes me threatening. What makes a black man non-threatening? <laughs> then if he's non-threatening, he don't belong to you. If he's non-threatening, he's their man not your man he looks like you but he works for them and that's a hell of a condition to be in to have a a man that you putting your hope in because he comes from your people but he's not working for his people there is not an italian here not a greek here not a Polish person, a Jewish person, an Irish person here who would vote for an Irish, an Italian, or a Jew to go anywhere if they didn't represent Jewish or Italian or Irish interests. You know that to be the fact. Why should we then settle for non-threatening politicians who rule and guide for others and do not stand for us when we are the majority who have elected them. <laughs> crossover politicians, they call them. You know what a crossover politician is? A crossover politician is like a crossover singer of songs. You know how it is, we start in the ghetto where we always start. And we start in those honky-tonk joints where we always start. Nobody hears us there but our own people. They pay uh, 75 cents for a beer, a dollar for a beer, and we sing and the people go out and say, man, did you hear a uh, 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 Gladys McKnight or Gladys Knight and the Pips? 
They are something. And after 20 years on what they call the chitlin circuit, some white person comes in and say, wow. And just like they discovered America with a whole country full of Indians, just like they discovered Australia with the Aborigines there, they discovered Gladys Knight. They discovered Stevie Wonder. They discovered, and then when they discover us, that's when we're known, you see? Farrakhan has been speaking to black people for 36 going on 37 years. Now, I didn't get discovered. Discovered. Until the great discoverer, the Christopher Columbus of black leadership, discovered me. I happened to be walking behind the Reverend Jackson, who had just a few years ago been discovered. <laughs> the very word discovery in the way you use it is a racist kind of term. You're not interested in black people, but when we can make a dollar for you, you become interested. When we can move you along, further your aims, your ambitions, your goals, you become interested in black people. But until then, you have no interest in us whatsoever. How dare you say that I'm bad for black Jewish relations? What black people do you relate to? You don't relate to the black people on 43rd Street in Chicago, 63rd Street, on the west side. We don't see a Jew. We don't know what you look like. So what kind of relationship am I messing up for you? You hypocrites. If you set up a black organization, somebody white knocking at the door, let me in. And if you don't let me in, you know, that's a racist group you're in. How many of you belong to Hillel? Ain't no black people belong to that, do you? Why not? Why not? You're not interested in that. You mean to tell me black people cannot have a black organization that, that speaks to black concerns without white folk in it? That that's racism? Please. <laughs> yes, you are all practicing reverse racism. No, the problem is you are so frightened to see black people get together. You think we're always conspiring against you. So when we get together, you got to come and try to join us. That's not my subject. I didn't come here to say that. But I just wanted you to, I just wanted to ventilate some of these things that are on my heart for these hypocrites that write in the newspaper about Farrakhan. You don't know me. You don't know me well enough. Some of you have never heard me, never had a chance to question me. But I'm here tonight. Thanks to these students. So I'm gonna hurry through our subject matter. But if you will listen to me, and this is not an anti-white tirade or somebody that's against white people or 
against Jewish people or against Arabs or Chinese or blacks. That's not the purpose at all. The purpose for truth is not to condemn color, but to condemn wrong. When wrong is condemned by the presence of truth, the wrongdoer in the light of truth has his or her actions or thoughts illuminated for them by the presence of truth. This is mercy from God because it allows us to correct our actions. If our actions go uncorrected, they bring in their wake consequences that may not be good for the actor. Great nations like this one have gone to ruin because people were hateful of truth. They despised that which corrected them. What makes one despise correction? It is arrogance. Arrogance is a state of mind that blinds us to truth. For we begin to feel that we are better than, bigger than, above criticism. How dare you tell me that I'm wrong? Do you know who I am? Truth, frankly, doesn't give a damn. Truth doesn't care who you are. Truth doesn't care what your position is. President is not above truth. Pope is not above truth. Prophet is not above truth. King is not above truth. Truth is the root of the universe. The universe may pass away, but the truth shall remain. So truth is what our lives are given to serve. It is truth that evolves us. It is truth that nurtures us. It is truth that makes us come into the path of God and makes us reflect the Creator. Truth. Falsehood created nothing. Falsehood can never be sustained. So you are at this university paying tens of thousands of dollars. Your parents are for you, young students, white and black and Jew and Gentile, to get the truth that you may make a better life for yourself and a better world in which you and we can live. The problem is, Arrogance blinds us to truth. Look, there is no discipline that you are studying where the person who wrote the book has a knowledge of that discipline that is absolute. God didn't write the textbook. So if Freud wrote it, it has a lot to be desired. Socrates was brilliant, but he wasn't God. So if you read Socrates, if you read Plato, if you read Tillich, whoever you read, if you read Dewey, if you read Machiavelli, whoever you read, not God. So what you are reading is a person who has studied what the Creator created and drew from the creation his perception of the truth and wrote it down in a book and made a dissertation or wrote a thesis and that became your book so you're studying from a student who has not yet perfected the discipline 
So if you are not trained to stand on the shoulders of the great thinkers to look beyond them, then you become enslaved to that which is imperfect and you become non-functional in a world that needs your mind. Listen, students. Listen. You are born for this day, for this time. Your minds are equipped to go beyond a man that wrote a hundred years ago, 25 years ago, even 10 years ago. You must never be enslaved to your teachers. You must honor and respect them but stand on their shoulders and move more toward the absolute. Knowledge is not a stagnant thing. Knowledge is an ever evolving thing as we move toward perfection. But once you stop the evolutionary process saying, I got it, that's when you lost it. Because what we know you could put on the head of a common pin and it would have much room left on that pin con uh, in comparison to what is in the universe for us yet to learn. The fact that we have a problem with garbage. Just think about that. Big problem. What are you going to do with your garbage? Oh, now, does that sound like trivia? Here's a barge going up and down the Atlantic Ocean filled with garbage, trying to find some place to dump it. Now, for 20 years, it's Earth Day. Isn't that wonderful? At last, after you all been in power all these years, you've learned now, oh my God. We better do something to protect the earth. The Native American could have told you that the day you met them. The Native Americans are the number one protectors of the environment. All their writings, all their speeches, all their old prophecies deal with environment. Why didn't we learn from them? Well, after all, I mean, they're nothing but savages, heathens. We are the great Christians who came to civilize these savages and teach them about the Lord Jesus Christ. You mean the Lord Jesus Christ didn't hip you all to environment? <laughs> you mean one who came to lead and guide us into all truth didn't tell you to protect the earth? But greed, you see, arrogance cause you to pollute the earth, pollute the air, pollute the water. Now you have a problem with garbage. But of course, you are studying economics. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> and the creator has no problem with anything. He recycles everything. What a masterful economist. But of course, God, let's, let's leave him out of this because what does God know? You put your little cheap knowledge above the knowledge of the creator. And that's why you're in the condition that you're in. Let me throw something out at our students. Beloved students, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us about pride. 
because we get so little and then we begin to strut just a little degree what did you get oh i have my bachelor's which one the bs or the ba well more the bs than the ba but one of those degrees i have now we can't stand you well, You put it on the wall. And what do you have? I have my master's. I, uh, yes. <laughs> and which one do you have, professor? Listen, I have two PhDs. And what does that make you? I am a doctor. Good. Doctor? If you are the doctor, what did you get your doctorate in? Well, I, I got my doctorate in sociology then why can't you heal the society? You see, the society presents you with problems that's beyond your degree. Isn't that right, doctor? Talk to me, doctor. You see, arrogance will make you lie to yourself. That I am a doctor of sociology. No, you're not. The very word doctor says you can heal whatever is wrong in the discipline that you study. Then heal this sick society, doctor. You don't even know where to begin. I have my doctorate in economics. You do, do you? Well, I'm, I'm a real doctor. I'm a healer. I, I, I graduated from medical school. Oh, you did, did you? And the doctors do not outlive their patients. He knows the art of healing. He dies at 47 with a stroke. More doctors are on drugs than their patients. But you're the doctor. I suggest that the doctor needs a doctor. And I respectfully suggest to you that what you call wisdom, God calls it foolishness. And what you call wisdom, he said, I will make the wisdom of this world foolishness with God. Because now the problems have overwhelmed the society. And you do not have the wisdom to solve the problems. This is done by the Creator, allowing you a free hand to let your hand create a mess that your own hand and mind can't solve, so that maybe, perhaps, you will become more humble and seek answers. And if you seek, you shall find. If you not, it shall be open unto you. And if you ask, it shall be given. But if you think you already have it, then you're not seeking nothing. And I respectfully suggest that this is the problem of the world. The leaders are really ignorant. And God is turning their wisdom backward. Look at Eastern Europe for a moment. Just about three months ago, Margaret Thatcher, Helmut Kohl, Mitterrand, Gorbachev, Bush, Shamir. They could sit together, talk together, but they could not predict the movement in Eastern Europe. Think about that. Mossad, which is the Jewish, the Israeli intelligence um, uh, component, something like America's CIA. Mossad. British intelligence, French intelligence, KGB, 
Russian intelligence, CIA, American intelligence could not, did not predict the movement in Eastern Europe. What does that tell you? If an elite, you who study political science, governments manage movement of people. Governments who control the means of propaganda actually direct the thought pattern, the actions of their uh, constituency. But here, is an elite that has power over the means of distribution of ideas. But they couldn't predict the movement of the people. What does that mean? There's another power at work in the world moving people beyond the power of government to stop that motion. So governments tumbled like this. You remember Ceausescu, the powerful Romanian dictator with his great squad of secret police? Look how quick he tumbled down. In two weeks time, the supposed impregnable man was overthrown. Do you remember the Shah of Iran? While he was here sitting with Jimmy Carter, tear gas was floating over the Rose Garden. Iranian protesters and Mr. Carter was saying, Oh, it's nothing. <laughs> He'll be around for a long time. This is powerful. But he was overthrown. When you see things happening afar off, be wise. Know that it can happen right in this great nation. There's a movement among the people today that government is not in control of. The fact that this media, who has been used to moving people, when they get ready for Gaddafi, they make the American public see Gaddafi as a terrorist. Terrorist. He's a terrorist. He's a terrorist. Then when they bomb him, they take a poll. What do you think? <laughs> this is to see whether their stuff is working. And when they took the poll, 86% of the American people agreed that America should bomb Gaddafi. But when the truth started coming out, that percentage started dropping dropping, dropping, until it got into the early 60%. The government managed well. When they got ready for Noriega, Mr. Noriega, he's a drug dealer. He's an indicted drug dealer. Terrible fella, that Noriega. Who was he dealing drugs for? Who was paying? Who was he in the employer? After the American public was all hyped up over Noriega, the poor people in Panama on the 19th of December getting ready to celebrate Christmas. And Bush brings out the stealth bombers and bombs Panama. And the American people say, isn't that wonderful? I mean, he got that guy. <laughs> he got him. But my dear black brothers and sisters, 
Noriega had his PDN headquarters in the middle of a district in Panama called Chorillo in Panama City. The Chorillo district is populated by blacks and mestizos. And the Panama University that has a, a, a device that measures um, earthquakes, they said in the first few hours, they recorded over 1,700 bombs that fell. And these bombs were over 2,000 pounds. And do you know what? They didn't kill just 300 like they said. According to the University of Panama, a minimum of, of at least 5,000 men, women, and children were killed by this mad bomber in Washington, D.C., who doesn't want Mr. Gaddafi to have chemical warf uh, 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 plant to produce chemical war uh, heads. But here's a government that can kill the world a hundred times over right. with her stockpile. That's right. And what other December 19th is planned? Like his predecessor, Mr. Reagan, planned to invade Grenada. Yeah. Little tiny Grenada. Right. Right. We sent our troops in. We got a communist government out. And then they put a black man in place, Mr. Colin Powell. Jumped over 30 white generals that some say were more qualified so that the Negro mentality would say, isn't that wonderful? We have a black man who is chief or head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Colin Powell wasn't in on the planning of the bombing, but Colin Powell was used to come and explain it away to the American people. Why? Because your people were being killed. Now, if you don't think this is serious, I would like to bring this talk to a climax by quoting from the Holy Quran, which is the book of scripture of the Muslims, and then tying it together <clears throat> to say to the students, black and white, the future does not look good. Unless change is made, America does not have the future that she would like to make you think she has. And you don't have any future at all if you continue to think the way you think now. And how do you think as a student? You think that when you get your degree, you're going to go out and they got a job for you. Wrong thought. Wrong thought. As factories in America close down and move to Mexico and other places where labor is cheap, Black folk more and more out of work. If you think that white folk are going to prepare jobs for you, you got another thought coming. You are here at Illinois State to learn that which will allow you to create a job for yourself. And if you don't do that, then your learning has been in vain. Do you hear me? Just like the basketball team, maybe one or two of those black stars will make the NBA. 
the rest of them, if they don't have anything up here, after they graduate, that's it, brother. <laughs> you played beautifully when you were here, but when we can't use you no more, that's the end of that. And to the white students, the world is changing so fast, you cannot face the world that is coming in with the mind of white supremacy. That mind will render you incapable of handling what you're about to see. What you are seeing signs of heavily now. You got a few more minutes? Yeah. Here is a verse uh, of the Quran. This is a very magnificent book that is not on bookshelves in America, but it's powerful. Listen. In a chapter called Al Asr, meaning the time. Muslims pray five times a day, but there is a prayer that we pray that is called Salatul Asr. And the Asr prayer comes when the sun has fallen away from its zenith and is like midpoint between the zenith and its setting. We measure time by the Earth's rotation on its axis and its revolution around the sun. So the Earth could not rotate on her axis without the light of the sun, nor could she revolve around the sun without the light of the sun. So it is our relationship to the sun that gives us our days and our years. So this chapter is called The Time. The Time. And if you don't have your watch, if you know the sun and the relationship of the earth, you can look at the sun and tell the time. You can look at the shadows even and tell the time by the shadow. Mm. Listen now. So Allah says in the Quran, in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, by the time, surely man is in loss, except those who believe and do good and enjoin one another to truth and enjoin on one another patience very pregnant. I'd like to deliver a few babies here. <laughs> By the time, the word or the uh, preposition by means that the time is the criterion by which actions are judged. Listen. By the time, surely man is in loss. Why is man losing? His actions are not corresponding with the dictates of the time. When you are out of time, have you ever tried to plant out of time? Nothing happens. Have you ever tried to harvest out of time? Nothing happens. When you go to the disco, if the music is beat, what is that? Time. And your dance gotta be what? 
right in a court with the time, but if you don't know how to dance, you can't keep that time and people don't want to dance with you because you're not keeping time. Have you ever been in a band and the drummer who is keeping the time can't keep that time? He speeds it up, then he slows it down. No musician can play with a drummer that doesn't keep time. Everything is done by time. The whole human body is based on rhythm. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so when you sing the song, I got rhythm, I got rhythm. What you talking about? <laughs> you think that means a Negro that got a lot of rhythm. <laughs> <laughs> But look, this heart has a rhythm that it has to keep. When it speeds up or slows down, this is a worry for a doctor, the vital sign. Rhythm, pulse, beat, blood, pressure, rhythm, timing. Everything is on time. But when you get out of sync, out of time, things don't go well for you. When the body is not working rhythmically right, the organs begin to work at odds and it creates dis-ease or disease. Time, what time is it? Not by this watch, what time is it by the universal clock each prophet that came into the world marked time and if you can't read the prophets you can't read the clock and if you don't know the time then you don't know what you should be doing and if you don't know what to do and you don't know the time then you're about to lose not only what you have but you can lose your life because you're not on time now this y'all all right please follow me now the sun when it reaches its zenith you watch the shadow is very short when the sun rises in the east and strikes an object, the shadow is long in the west. But when that sun reaches the zenith, the shadow has drawn up from the west back to the object. And as the sun starts setting, the shadow starts going back toward the east. A lot of wisdom in that. When that sun is setting, it's like saying that a world's time is coming to an end. And if you notice, when the sun sets, it sets in the west. And if you watch one of these beautiful sunsets, the sky looks like it's on fire. And this is what God threatens the world with at the end. It is total fire. The Western world has exercised power over all the darker people of the earth. You agree? Yes, sir. The light shined in the east. And the shadow on the western powers gave a long shadow in the west, meaning the western world or white world began an ascendancy to power. <laughs> but it's Asr now. It's afternoon. The sun is setting on white world supremacy. Listen, just listen, don't get emotional, just listen. That kind of apartheid, 
I'm better because I'm white. That don't work anymore. It's being challenged by the rising sun. The sun rose in the east again. The Japanese, you beat them in war, but now they're beating you in economy, in technology, in mathematics, in banking. Their society is much further advanced than this one. America is being a loser. She's decaying. Not because somebody is more powerful on the outside, but there is a rot and a decadence going on inside America that is bringing this nation down. I'm appealing to you, black and white, Jew and Gentile, we all live in America, but America cannot continue to exist as she is. Listen. The sun is now setting on Western world supremacy over the dark peoples of the earth. In the 21st century, if America does not check her fall now, America will be a third-rate power when we get into the 21st century. Strategic metals that America needs to be the superpower in the 21st century are in Southern Africa. He who gets control of Africa may be able to sustain supremacy in the 21st century, but we intend to control our destiny. So if we control our destiny, then where's Western supremacy going to be when you got to deal with black Africa? And you can't deal with us like your fathers did. You have to deal with us wiser than your fathers, more just than your fathers, because the black world outnumbers white people 11 to 1 on this earth, so we are not any minority. We are the majority, and that majority is now coming into power. Listen, you can't stop the power of the rise of the dark world. China is up now, a billion strong, and she remembers what America did. The Japanese have not forgotten. I'm just telling you. Don't let anybody lull you to sleep. They have not forgotten. They're not like black people. <laughs> black people may forgive and forget, but not Chinese. The Japanese. Y'all all right? <laughs> this is serious. China now has rockets that are putting satellites into space and her rockets have been more consistent and effective than American rockets. So she's competing for the world's business now. China. Korea is up and moving. Vietnam whipped America. Wait a minute now. Did you hear me? They called it an honorable peace. But the Vietnamese drove the Americans out of there. America is used to this brutish kind of thing. Bomb, 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 bomb. They didn't know these people learned to live underground. And they'd go underground and America would bomb, then they'd come up. America never had that kind of fight before. Ask the Vietnam veterans. And after they fought that war, they come home to be mistreated. Many Vietnam veterans are angry, dissatisfied, because the government
government sent them to war and the government never backed them up. Many of them dying with cancer because of Agent Orange and the government is hedging on its responsibility to its own citizens. Oh, this is serious. You think that revolution is not coming inside America? You just keep breathing. And if the government continues to mistreat the American people as the government is doing, lying to the American people, deceiving the American people, you think it's the blacks going to rise, but your own people are going to rise up. The National Rifle Association has armed white America well. <laughs> Arm them for you. Oh, I've got to make it plain. Because see, if you don't know what time it is, you really don't know what's happening, brother and sister. And I'm not here just to make you feel good. I'm here to hip you. And if I never see you again, you'll never forget what you heard me say tonight. Never in your life will you forget. Because every day that you live, the truth of what I said is going to come home to you. We're in danger, black brother and sister, in grave danger. I'm almost finished. By the time we're in loss. Y'all all right? Look, we, oh, it's early. It's early. Y'all yeah. were just gonna party, this is Saturday night. But I don't want to keep you long. You know. But I do want to uh, say this. If I were in the government, I would not let America lower her defenses. Because this is the lull before the storm. By the time to the Jewish students who are present, you just celebrated Passover, a time in the Jewish calendar when you celebrate your freedom biblically from Pharaoh. You know, as Jews, that Pharaoh had a plan against the children of Israel because he saw them multiplying, you remember? And Pharaoh said, let's deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, join on to an enemy of ours and come against us. So what was Pharaoh's plan? Kill all the male children of the children of Israel. Jewish history is replete with kings that plotted against the life of the whole Jewish nation. When you read in the Bible of Queen Esther and Mordecai and Haman and Ahasuerus you're reading about a plot at the highest level against a whole people to slaughter them all. You think that's in the Bible for nothing? If some of you as Jews feel that in your history you have lived that, then you know that governments do plan against people that they don't like. Did Hitler plan? Do you think that I, Louis Farrakhan, admired Hitler as a murderer? And admired a man that hated 
blacks as well as Jews? Don't misread me. You know better than that. But Hitler came to power and he had in his mind the killing of an entire people. He felt that Germany could not rise unless the Jews were crushed. He felt that way. And did he plan against their lives? Did he? Did history say he did? Listen, brothers and sisters, I'm not talking to be talking. That's just 40 years ago. That man planned against the life of a whole people. Did some of the Jews think that Hitler was not really against them? Did some of the middle class Jews think that maybe Hitler was not going to deal with them because they were doctors and lawyers and teachers and it was only the riffraff Jews that Hitler was after? But Hitler had something for everyone, didn't he? He failed, didn't he? But look how many millions he killed. Would you be surprised if I told you that the government in which we live has the same plans for you? Wait, wait, wait now, wait. I know what you say. It's incredible. Farrakhan is suffering from paranoia. Uh-uh, baby. <laughs> that man is just prejudiced. I'm not prejudiced. To be prejudiced is to judge before a knowledge of the facts. We've lived under this government for 430 years. We know what this government is capable of doing. Let me help you to understand. Now, brothers and sisters, you and your fathers built this country before many of these whites knew that America existed, your fathers were here building this. Agree? Many of these whites, most of these whites, all of these whites had nothing to do with slavery. They had nothing at all to do with what happened to our fathers. Is that true? It is true. They weren't here. They just weren't here. <laughs> Some of these white students are second and third generation Americans. You were here before the Mayflower. You came according to what is written in the Congressional Library in Washington and what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us. You came in 1555 on a ship named Jesus the first slaves were brought into America and according to W.E.B. Du Bois one of our greatest historians and social scientists he wrote that a conservative estimate of our Holocaust was a hundred million black lives lost in the Middle Passage Nobody talks about black suffering. We don't own CNN, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox Broadcasting. You can tell your story. And when you tell it, nobody accused Jews of teaching hatred against Germans. You're just teaching remembrance. Remembrance so that it will never happen again. But when I remind my people of what we have suffered at the hands of white people and still suffer, right. 
That's a hate monger. He's living with hatred. How is it remembering for you, but hatred for me? No, it's the same thing. I want my brothers and sisters to remember. In fact, to remember means that it once was in your mind and you forgot. No, it never was in your mind because you don't even know what happened to you. Now, I'm going to say it real quick. When our fathers were brought to these shores, the slave masters knew they could not enslave a people rich in the knowledge of God. You didn't come out of Africa jungle bunnies. You don't build a nation as a jungle bunny. And there's no record that these whites taught us how to build. We built the mansions in the South. Yeah, we did it. We did the iron work, the carpentry, the masonry. Yeah. We dressed the white woman, taught her how to cook. Savages don't know how to cook. But look at you. You were not allowed family. They mated us like animals. And when the child was born, they separated the children from the parents, killed the parents, so that the child is reared with eyes, but it can't see, ears, but it can't hear, tongue, can't speak. That's how you grew up. 30 million people that can't speak one word of your own mother tongue didn't even know what it is. This is why today you don't have your names. You wear the names of white people. Johnson, Jones, Campbell, Murphy, O'Reilly, O2, O'Fu. Look at you. Overbrook scored again. Overbrook. Underhill got it again. Roundtree did it this time. These are not your names. And poor thing, you in Illinois State signed in wrong. And you know, when a man signs his name wrong, poor fellow's a victim of amnesia. Nothing he does. Can you judge him for them? He's been hitting his head. You Masons, you know what I'm talking about. Brothers, you were not allowed to take a woman and marry her and develop a family. That's why our families are broken today. It was slavery that broke up the black family. He was allowed to get you pregnant. And that's what he does today. He has not been washed of the stench of slavery. Not yet. He doesn't have a healthy regard for his women today. He does not respect his woman today. She's an object of pleasure, but she's not a serious creation of Almighty God. And this is why you sisters are catching hell night and day, because you're looking for a man that will love you and honor you and respect you for what you are. And this goes for white women also. 
men are not dealing with you for what you are, for who you are. They're not dealing with your mind. They want to deal with something that rhymes with mine. You heard me. And some of you sisters and women are dumb enough to allow that to continue. And that's why you get no respect. You allow it. You allow men to make you a piece of meat. Like when you buy meat, take it out of the case and let me see it. It ain't red enough. Let me feel it. Now that's the piece. Weigh it up. How much it costs. And that's what you're doing to yourself. On television, it's boobs and butt. Don't you ever let anybody dehumanize you, woman. Without a woman, there is no man. And I'm not putting us down, brothers. But from the time the slave master had us, they made us stud horses. Big, strong black men that made babies, but the master took care of them. So we're not interested in responsibility. You're interested in pleasure. But no man deserves pleasure unless he's worthy of pleasure. What are you saying, Farrakhan? Let me help you to understand. See, sisters, women, God created all of you in a very special way. The Bible says he created woman Listen, as the help meet of the man, not mate, help mate, help meet. To meet means to join, to connect. What are you talking about, Farrakhan? Adam was given a mission. Adam was told, multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it. He was made to become a master, and the woman was made to help him become a master. You can't become what you should be without a woman. That's why God gave the woman to the man. But to deny the woman is to deny yourself. To crush the woman is to crush yourself. So when you got a man that's going no place, listen to me. Y'all all right? Don't get mad, brothers. Don't get mad. Don't, don't be angry with me. You ask the brother, honey, what do you want to be in life? I don't know. I mean, I mean, what is your goal in life? Goal. I just, just throw this ball in this hoop. I'm going to get 20 points tonight. Now, sister, <laughs> you can't build no future on 20 points tonight. 
If a man doesn't know where he's going, how can you help him meet his objective and he has none? And how can a man want pleasure and consolation when he's not working to deserve consolation? Uh-oh. I said something wrong. Do you know that a woman, I don't care what her color is, loves a man who's going someplace? That's why she likes to take his arm. You don't take a man's arm, he ain't going no place. And if she sees the man working hard on an objective that is of God, he, he inspires love in her. She'll stay up with him to help him meet his objective. She'll work with him. She'll give him good suggestions from the female perception of reality. When a man is not thinking about nothing. Hey, baby, let's uh, go over here. I want to talk to you, man. I want to talk to you. You better stay out of that kind of conversation. Because the minute you become pregnant, then you go to him and say, Honey, I'm. I'm expecting. So what are you expecting? Don't tell me that. You better get rid of that. Why? You want pleasure but no responsibility? And y'all want pleasure but you don't want responsibility? You run from responsibility to the abortion clinic? It's bad, isn't it? Bad for us at 19 to kill or at 14 to kill. But it's all right for you to kill the fruit of the womb and the answers to your prayers. All our prayers are answered through the babies that we produce. The cure for cancer is coming from the womb of some woman. The cure for AIDS is coming from the womb of some woman. The cure for the diseases of the world are coming through the women. And you don't know what you're killing. Suppose Mary, because of the tragic circumstances of her life, killed the fruit of her womb. Look what we would have missed. Well, you got a people now, a government that's frightened because of your numbers. Three hundred years they worked us for nothing. We never got paid. But America became rich. You see, you all didn't do that to us. But the whites today benefited from what happened to us. That is what you have to answer now. You know, Senator Kennedy, you remember the song about John Kennedy? Has anybody here seen my old friend Johnny? Can you tell me where he's gone? <laughs> John and Bobby and Martin. Did you know that John's father was a, a booze bootlegger who got rich selling illegal whiskey. 
He was the dope dealer of his day. Wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. But Joe Kennedy, the dope dealer of his day, who became a multimillionaire, could give millions to his children and then made one a senator, two a senator, one a president. And when they talk about the Kennedys, when John was in the White House, they called it the Kennedy clan and Joseph the patriarch of the family. They never mentioned Joe the bootlegger. But suppose your father or mine sold crack and got millions of dollars and sent you to Illinois State? And then you became student government leader and then came out and started running for office. I bet you the press would say, so-and-so whose father was a notorious crack dealer to discredit you for what your father did. Well, if we take that same yardstick, how many of you present day whites can stand up on what your fathers did? Let me see, let me show you something. Look at this, this is justice. Y'all all right? to work you for 300 years, give you nothing? All the white children going to school, it's against the law for you to learn. White folks going to church, you can't even pray. Did you know that? In 1744, Reverend, they said it wasn't incompatible for you to be a slave and a Christian. So white folks set up the black church, not in their church, it was a separate church. But I'm the separatist. They set up a separate church and then they told black folk what they had to preach. Preach this part of the New Testament. Slaves, Obey your master. If I smite you on one cheek, what you supposed to do? If I take your coat, what you supposed to do? Give me your pants. You supposed to pray for those that despitefully use you and you're supposed to love your enemy. And that's what you've been doing for a hundred years up from slavery, loving your enemies, hating your friends, and destroying yourself. Look at your condition. This is the way you've been taught. The Constitution and Abraham Lincoln, bless his heart. Honest Abe. He freed us, didn't he? <laughs> Abraham Lincoln gave us this Emancipation Proclamation and we never did look up the word emancipation. It's a big difference from emancipation and freedom, you know. Check it out in your dictionary. Don't get one of these little pocket size. Get an Oxford dictionary and run it down. We don't have time tonight. And by the way, when you're checking it out, check out the meaning of the word American. I know you think you're an American. <laughs> Did you know that no black, no Asian, no Arab, according to the definition of an American, can be an American? unless America repudiates the old definition and writes a new one. The definition for an American is a descendant of the European people, not one belonging to the ab-original 
people or races of the earth. Go look it up. And that's why you catch hell. Everybody else can come and they don't have to sing we shall overcome and get a picket sign and march. But you've been here longer than anybody else and get less justice than anybody else because by reality America don't have no law that respects you that she feels she's bound to respect. She write it in and then rescind it. Check it out. The Aryan Brotherhood, the skinheads, they're not the bad people. They're only acting out the philosophy of the founding fathers of this country. The founding fathers of this country did not say we the people for Arabs or Chinese or Native Americans or blacks. We the people meant we white people of a certain aristocratic background. They didn't even mean we poor white people because poor white people in this society catch hell. The rich run it all and the poor die to make it better for the rich. This has to change. So I'm leaving you now with these words. Listen, don't black folk, we're in trouble. You're having a lot of babies and white folks aren't having enough. So the demographers are saying that by the year 2000, the birth rate for whites will be zero population growth, a birth for every death. But in Time Magazine two weeks ago, they had a front page saying, what will America be like when America is no longer white? Listen, listen, listen. Then on the inside, they called it the browning, the browning of America. And they said that in a few years, whites are going to be the minority. And in a few, no, 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 no. Don't clap too loud. Listen, shh. <laughs> they said that this is going to change America politically, economically, socially, and culturally. Now, brothers, you know how strong the seed of the black man is. Anybody we touch is no longer what they were. <laughs> this is why white folks don't like to see you with their women. <laughs> Y'all know it's true. Any white woman that has a baby for us, you know it ain't white. And even a white man, if he has a baby by a black woman, it still ain't white. She's so strong, she colors your stuff. She's strong, brother. So look, y'all can promote integration if you wanna. You just promoting the browning and the blacking of America. You gonna put on a dark face for real, baby. <laughs> yeah, I can see it now. You know how y'all used to black your face up in the, in the Greek fraternities and make mockery? Y'all ain't gonna have to do that for long. That's gonna be the real deal, baby. And you women ain't gonna have to go and frizz it up. It'll be that way. and sister it's our time God has said our time to serve white people as slaves is up God didn't make 
you to be their servants forever. It was only to last for 400 years. The 400 years is up. And if you still got a servant mentality, you're out of time and you're going to suffer loss. What time is it? It's time for you to get up now and do something to help yourself. It's time for you to unite with yourself and your people in love and brotherhood. It's time to do that. It's time. Listen. To the white students, it's time for the mind of white supremacy to break up. It is time you, as white students, need a new kind of teaching. A teaching that will prepare you to meet the new world, which is brown, red, yellow, black. That new world coming in, you got to meet with that world. And you can't meet with that world like your fathers met with that world because they were asleep when your fathers met with them, but they're waking up today. So you got to have a new kind of mind. You got to be prepared. And Illinois State University is not preparing the white students to meet what they're going to meet in the next century. They're not preparing you at all. And that's why Farrakhan is a man of value, not only to the black, but he's valuable to whites. If you will listen to me, you can live. Listen. Now, brothers and sisters, to you. Our black men are an endangered species. You young men, I'm so proud of the young men that I met tonight. These young men, the future is safe with these young men. But brothers, you're in danger. Because the government is thinking, we got to deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. 25% of our young men are in jail, on parole, or under court supervision. We have a very high infant mortality rate that says that we are subject to lose or likely to lose another whole generation. Listen, they program us for unemployment and then put drugs in the community. After they show you the lifestyle of the rich and the famous, they know that you're not gonna work at Wendy's for 335 an hour. So now what do you do? If there's no job for you, what you gonna do? He's taking your woman and bringing her downtown Chicago, downtown Peoria, she got the job, brother. What are you doing? You got an education just like her. But when they hire her, they say, we've satisfied our minority requirement. But they won't hire that black man. So you feel inferior now. Look at the problems in the home. The black man is home watching the soaps. The wife is out working. He doesn't feel like a man. So the least little thing that she says to him out of place, he's in her mouth. Great stress. More killing in the family. Look at us killing ourselves. Yes, it's bad that white folk kill us, but it's worse that we are slaughtering ourselves. Can you see it? You're programmed right now for self-destruction. But the biggest hype is being worked by the government. Did you see President Bush lure a black brother in front of the White House to sell some crack? And then he gets on television and holds up a bag of cocaine and said right in front of the White House. They're selling drugs. 
They who? Young black man. What signal is that sending to white America? That's saying to white America, good God, these niggas are despoiling our capital. No, 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 no. I'm not trying to be smart. The white minds are being set up right now for our destruction. That's why there's an increase on the campuses of racial uh, incidents, an increase of police killings of blacks, and the attitude among whites is, why not? They're animals. Did you see the white girl a year ago, yesterday or the day before, the white girl that got raped in Central Park? She went out jogging at midnight in Central Park. And about eight black people, they say, jumped that woman, beat her, and raped her repeatedly. And the next day, all the liberals were calling for the death penalty. Mr. Trump, a liberal, took out ads, full page ads, calling for the death penalty. The police went crazy, went in the community, snatched eight young men, brought them to jail, put their names in the paper, went to their school, and guess what? They tested the semen in the woman against the semen of the eight young men. And according to the DNA, it didn't match up. Now listen, listen, listen. But the sad thing is, they didn't come back in the paper and say, got the wrong eight. Do you know the only semen that matched in that woman was the semen of her boyfriend. But the papers didn't come back. Not the Peoria newspaper. Not the Bloomington Normal newspaper. Very abnormal the way they treat it. Not the Chicago newspapers. But this went all over the world. Do you remember Charles Stewart in Boston? You remember how the press played that up? The white man who married this beautiful white girl, it was Camelot again. That's the way they, that's the way they did it. I'm not making anything up. She got pregnant. And on the way from a birthing class, guess what? A black person somehow got in the back of their automobile <laughs> and shot the woman in the head. Then got out and got around the front and shot him too. <laughs> and all of us heard it on the news. The poor man. Fell at 911 asking him, Can you tell us where you are? Where are you? <gasps> I, I don't know where I am. Oh God, oh God, oh God. I hear a gurgling sound. I think she's dying. I think she's dying. Hold on. Hang on now. Where are you? Sympathy rising all over the country. Black and white saying, Oh no, oh no, this is terrible. Who did this to you? It was a black man with a gruff voice. <laughs> And the whole country and the whole world is alarmed. And the press knew within 24 hours that something was wrong, but they kept that thing going for nearly three weeks to a month. And then when the truth was coming out, 
the man allegedly killed himself because he had planned for a year to kill his wife. Now, brothers and sisters, I told you earlier that when they got ready to bomb Gaddafi, he was a terrorist. When they got ready to bomb Noriega, he was a dope trafficker. They're getting ready for you. And so our young men are being painted as thugs, gangbangers, violent savages. Do you hear me? I know you think I'm just making this up. But brother, for nearly three years, they've had young gangbangers in Los Angeles and other places on the television. You don't see the gangbangers saying nothing. You just see them kneeling down in the street with their hands behind their back and the press saying, we're taking back the streets. Who's promoting the gang violence? You think we just killing each other over colors? Where did these gangbangers get a Uzi? A, 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 a automatic weapon made in Israel and an AK-47 made in China and a street sweeper, a shotgun that fires 12 rounds in nearly six seconds. Where did they get these kind of weapons? Somebody's giving it to them. And as long as they kill each other, it's all right. But the news every day, gang violence, gang violence. Washington, D.C., so many hundred dead, and you show bodies laying out in the streets. And this is creating in the mind of American people. The niggas are ruining our country. Isn't there something that can be done? And all the politicians are talking law and order. Look at it. Then the police are saying they don't have enough firepower. So the National Guard is moving in to certain cities now. Brothers and sisters, Pharaoh brought his army out against the children of Israel. And America is planning to do the same for you. And we don't have much time. They see Farrakhan as public enemy number one. <laughs> and all this stuff that they're putting in the paper. Farrakhan this, Farrakhan that, Farrakhan this. So Farrakhan decided I'd like to let the American people see me. So in one week's time, I was on several major television shows. And many whites have written me letters. Some of them priests. Thanking me. For the way I handled the ignorance of their people. If you go back over the Donahue show, a woman stands up and says, just look at you, standing there, leering at us, <laughs> looking down at us. What was wrong with that poor woman? You know what was wrong with her? A black man, highly intelligent, not allowing their ignorance to get me in a shouting match with foolish people. She could not understand a black man speaking with authority, who wasn't scratching when he wasn't itching. Another white woman says, 
Yes, these jobs. I bet you if a white man and a black man went to get the job, the black man would get the job first. Listen, no, wait, wait, wait. Here is a white woman in pain over affirmative action. Affirmative action was a remedy given by the court to remedy and offset some of the evils that the country has done to black people. But white people can't take even a little pain to see you get any measure of justice. So this woman cries out, Mr. Donahue, he says, why do you keep saying if? Get to the bottom line. You know you don't agree. Why do you say if? Why are you trying to mollify us? I said out of respect for the minds of your listeners. I wasn't talking down to them. See, he would like for me to be dogmatic and not intelligent. When you are dogmatic, you go to the bottom line. That doesn't allow people to travel with you. So in the process of reasoning, you always set up an hypothesis. Why? You know the answer, but you're not it's not your answer that you're trying to get. You're trying to lead a mind to a conclusion. So you say, if side, angle, side of this triangle is equal to side, angle, side of triangle B, then the triangle, then conclusion, triangles are said to be what? Congruent. What is that? Process of reasoning so when you're dealing with people's minds because you know the answer don't assume that everybody knows it you have to if you respect human beings gently lead their minds so that we all come to a similar conclusion that is if you're a teacher that's my job teaching so Donahue said, get to the bottom line so that I can close off many minds. No, I'm not going to do that, Mr. Donahue. The point is, the American people have to see the man and hear the man for themselves. Then they can make the judgment. Brothers and sisters, we're in trouble. And uh, Bush is trying to get rid of Farrakhan. And, you know, to the, to the Jewish people that are in the house, there's nothing that I can say to you that would make you think that I don't have evil in my heart against your people. Nothing. I'm not trying to push you in an oven, but I know there's one. I know that there's an oven for us all. The sun is setting. You're not going to mistreat me and get away with it. No, 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 just listen. I'm not before you of myself. If I am, then you don't have anything to worry about. But if I'm backed by God, you better leave me alone. Listen, are you threatening us? You can take it like that. It is a threat. Because death is hanging over your head too. And that's right. And you may not like it, but I'm standing between you and death. And for you to call for my death and tell Jewish children that I'm another Hitler, that all I want to do is kill Jews. Ridiculous. 
you say that I'm scapegoating Jews while in reality Jewish leaders are scapegoating me to you making the young Jews in every college campus that I go to turn out to oppose Louis Farrakhan. That's all right with me. But remember this now. Remember this. You have not a good record with the prophets. You don't have a good record with them. No, 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 I'm not laughing. I think this is serious. I'm not a prophet. I'm not a prophet. But I am a man with a message in my mouth for the deliverance of my people. And if you kill me or attempt to kill me, because I speak truth to my people, how will that put you? How will that stand you in the stead or in the eyes of God? You kill everybody that you don't like. Martin is gone. Malcolm is gone. Marcus Garvey gone. Everybody you don't like, you either get one of us to do it or you do it yourself. And literally, white folks are talking about there's a bullet for that firecon. No, 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 you haven't got a gun big enough. <laughs> listen, listen, listen. I'm in your midst and I'm not running from you. Because I know if you kill me, I'll be the last one that you kill. It'll be all over then. Let me tell you something. There is a God who is plaguing this country right now, even as Jehovah plagued Egypt. Listen good, because you're going to meet it. I'm a warner. You can take it or leave it alone. I don't have no other country to go to but America. I live here. I grew up here. I would like to see America save herself. But if you think, if this government thinks it can get away with killing the people of God, You'll get everything that you put on us and then some. And you are the generation that is at risk. You young whites. Yours is the generation. You can escape it or the full wrath of God can come down on this generation. Prepare slaughter for the children for the iniquities of their father. But these children did not kill us. They are the beneficiaries of their father's evil. Now what you've got to do is recognize that as you are the beneficiaries of your father's evil, these have been destroyed because of that. And if the present generation of whites will do what the West German, East Germans are doing for the Jews. Let me read this to you as I leave you. New York Times, April the 13th, East Berlin, a statement of apology to Israel. East Berlin, listen to what they said. I'm only gonna read some of it. We ask the Jews of the world to forgive us. We ask the people of Israel to forgive us for the hypocrisy and hostility of official East German policies toward Israel 
and for the persecution and the degradation of Jewish citizens after 1945 in our country. We declare our willingness to contribute as much as possible to the healing of mental and physical sufferings of survivors and to provide just compensation for material losses. Isn't that a wonderful statement by the East Germans for their evil against the Jews? Let's give them a hand. Now look, America recognizes she did wrong to the Japanese. She took Japanese Americans and put them in concentration camps and confiscated their property for four years. Come on. And the U.S. Congress has voted to do what? Pay what? Say it loud. Reparations. Reparation means do something to repair the damage. I close. Let me read this over and change the word Jews. I'm putting it in white folks' mouth. If America could have the courage to say what the Germans said, listen, we ask the blacks of the world to forgive us. How many of you got the courage to ask black people to forgive you for killing them wholesale in Africa, in the isles of the Pacific? for killing the Native Americans and for bringing our fathers into slavery, into the Black Holocaust. How many are willing to ask us to forgive them? Listen, and we ask especially the black people of America to forgive us for the hypocrisy. See, we want integration, lie. This is all hypocrisy. No real meaning to it. We ask you to forgive us for the hypocrisy and the hostility of official United States government policies toward black people. Because it was government official policy to kill all our leaders. Did you know that? Government policy. Yeah. And for the persecution and degradation of our so-called black citizens. We declare our willingness to contribute as much as possible to the healing of mental and physical suffering of the survivors. That's you, black people. and to provide just compensation for material losses. Now, what would that compensation be? Let's see if we can figure it out. A hundred million lives lost in the Middle Passage. Figure that out. 300 years of work for nothing. Figure that out. Turning a people inside robbing us of name, language, culture, religion, God, and making us so sick mentally that after they struck down involuntary slavery, we became voluntary slaves. Figure that out. Figure that out. Figure up that we died in the American Revolution for America's freedom. Figure that out. Figure it up that we died in the War of 1812 and in the Civil War, 400,000 black soldiers were in the blue and the gray on the side of the North and the South fighting to preserve a union that didn't give a damn about us. Figure that up. Figure it up. Figure up the lynching.
lynchings and the night riders. Figure it up. Figure up the land that we got and the land that was taken from us. Figure it up. Figure up World War I. We died and they crushed Germany and it never gave us nothing. World War II, we died in Normandy, in Sicily, in Palermo, in North Africa. We died to beat Germany. We died in Guadalcanal, in the Philippines, in Okinawa. We died at Pearl Harbor. Figure it out. And after the war is over, you rebuilt Germany and you rebuilt Japan. And the black man is here in America, not living in a decent house without a job, his children destroyed. Figure it up. We fought in Vietnam and in Korea. Figure it up. What is Martin Luther King's life worth to us? Figure it up. What are our leaders' lives in black organizations destroyed by government policy? Figure it up. And when you lay down what you owe us, you owe us the whole damn country. And we're not asking for that. for that all we're asking is for justice and that's the time if you don't give us justice you may lose it all so black students you get busy and you stop all this partying and foolishness and you get your act together as of tonight, you put down that reefer and you put down that crack and those pills and that drugs and get your head screwed on right. You cannot live today with a half high head. You got to be sober to see the tricks that's going down to rob you of your future, black man and woman. Don't come to Illinois State trying to make a white university relevant to black people. That's wasting valuable time. Come here and extract the knowledge and then go back and use it to build your community, build your people, build for yourself. Don't you come out of here looking for a job. Come out with a mind to try and create a job. Do you hear me, brothers and sisters? Stop all this talk about, I am an alpha. I am an omega. I am a kappa. I am a sigma. I am a delta. I am an AKA. What is that but more Greek letters? Jesus said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord. Come together. Stop all this talk. Stop all this talk about I'm a Baptist. I'm a Methodist. I'm an Episcopalian. I'm a Jehovah Witness. I'm a church of God in Christ. I'm holiness. I'm Pentecostal. Stop that kind of talk. Jesus never spoke like that. Speak as he spoke. He was baptized, but he wasn't a Baptist. Talk to me. He never said he was a Methodist. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He never said 
I'm a Catholic. He said, I am the light of the world, meaning I'm universal. He never said I'm a Jehovah's Witness, but it's a fact he was the witness of Jehovah. No question about it. He never said I'm holy. He said if the first fruit is holy, then the lump is also holy. He never said I'm Pentecostal, but without Jesus appearing before the disciples, there wouldn't be any day of Pentecost. These are your denominations. These are your divisions. Prophet Muhammad never said he was Sunni. He gave us the Sunnah. He never said he was Shiite. But through his daughter Fatima, he had Hussein and Hassan. Huh? Come on. He never said he was Hanafi, Sufi. That's your stuff. Be what he was. He was a Muslim. He submitted his will to do the will of God. Be what Jesus was. Jesus never said, I'm a Christian. Not one time. He never called his disciples Christians. Did you know that? They were called Christians at Antioch by the enemies of Jesus. Jesus said, not my will, but thy will be done. He submitted his will to do the will of God. Come on. So let us do that. Stop all this division. And let's come together as a family. And love each other. And respect each other. And work for the good of each other. Uphold each other. In right. Huh? And above all, respect. And protect. And honor your women respect protect and honor your women and to the white students if you will sit down with these black students in an honest dialogue without hypocrisy maybe tomorrow you might make better sense than tonight. Maybe after hearing what Farrakhan had to say, it didn't necessarily drive you further apart, you already apart. Maybe it gave you something, a basis upon which to start an honest dialogue. And through dialogue, maybe, you might learn to respect each other. And as I said on the Donahue show, white students, think about it. You didn't come in a vacuum. You study biology. And you learn Mendel's law. You know that dark skin is dominant and light skin is recessive. No, this ain't no black supremacy. Just that the truth is supreme. You know that dark eyes are dominant and light eyes are recessive. And you teach that you can get the recessive from the dominant. But you can't get the dominant from the recessive. So two white people can only produce white. You can never produce yellow. It's just not in your genetic makeup to do that. It's a biological, mathematical impossibility. But, but, the black man can produce from jet black people an albino with blonde hair and light eyes showing you that in us is the whole human family of the earth and from the black man whom the honorable Elijah Muhammad called the original people of the earth that's why you're black you're not black because you're cursed 
You're black because you are the original life in the universe. Yes. Yes. You say, I, I can't believe it. And I thought I was black and ugly. No, no. You are black and beautiful because you are original. Just be yourself. Don't try to be white people. Be you. Fall in love with you. Jesus said, love your neighbor as who? Yourself. So you can't love your neighbor if you don't love yourself. So fall in love with yourself. Then maybe you'll be able to love your neighbor. And since you don't live in nobody else's neighborhood, I guess your neighbor looks just like yourself. Well, thank you for inviting me. I know I stayed all night, but may God bless you all. Thank you, Illinois State University. Thank you, black students. May Allah bless you as I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum.